Hello. Oh, this is weird. Um, hello, thank you for coming here. Uh, really happy to have you. Um, we are going to talk about Kubernetes storage today. Um, so first of all, who am I? I'm doing platform engineering at Scandio. Um, I work mostly with, with cloud native technologies. That's my GitHub. Um, yeah, this is, this is going to be a talk that's a bit heavy on opinions. Uh, so if you see the asterisk, that's an opinion. It might be technically wrong. I, or, or it might be a simplification, but we can talk about that. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, asterisk or not, you can uh, talk to me later. I'm going to be around for a few minutes. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So let's talk first talk about the Kubernetes storage model. Um, Kubernetes does not come with a baked-in storage solution. Um, there's this thing called the container storage interface which allows you to connect external storage providers to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and if you want to interact with Kubernetes storage, you use mostly these three resources. There are a few more, but those are the ones that are important for you as a developer. If you're a platform operator, you care about a few more, but like, these are the main ones. Um, of those, you will mostly interact with persistent volume claims. Um, Basically, the role here is um, you request some sort of storage, um, you specify some like rough outline, like how much storage you want and from what storage class, and then things happen and you get that storage. Um, you if you specify a storage class, it even happens automatically. Um, so this is called dynamic provisioning, where you create a persistent volume claim and you specify a storage class in that persistent volume claim and then things happen, and you get a persistent volume, which, per <laughs> so there's some laughing back there, but it's, it's really how that works. I, I only have like 30 minutes, and 30 minutes is a really short time if you want to talk about storage and databases. Um, so I'm really sorry for just like making a hard cut here. Um, so yeah, you provision a persistent volume claim, some backend storage gets provisioned somewhere, and you can use it. Um, there's another thing called static provisioning, which I have never seen in practice before. Another one, the same guy like shaking his head. Yeah, um, it's basically the same thing, but with a storage class, but there is basically a dude coming around and like attaching an existing persistent volume to your persistent volume claim, which is insane. But if I guess if you have like 50 network bound SSDs uh, and you can't be asked to write, sorry for swearing, um, to write a CSI driver for that. That's apparently how you did it in the beginning, um, but no one do, does that anymore. Um, <laughs> there are also some attachment semantics. You basically don't only care about the first two because the second, uh, the, the other half of them is just, yeah, they exist, but not many people use them. The main ones are the top two and the differences. You can attach a volume to one node at a time or multiple nodes at a time um, and yeah. It's, it's attachment semantics, so yeah. <laughs> you re use read-write once wherever you can and read-write many if you have to, uh, yeah. And also let's talk about what kind of storage providers there are, like storage providers is basically whatever implements a CSI interface in this context. Um, there are like native cloud provider integrations, uh, EBS is an example, Azure Disk is another one, Azure Files, you have like this kind of stuff, the cloud provider, provides them for money and writes a CSI driver, you can use them in your cluster. Um, there are like integrations for external sh storage clusters like Pure Storage, for example, vSphere. There are also some more, some more exotic ones like JuiceFS. Um, the third one is storage operators. That's actually storage running in your cluster. Um, that's an interesting use case if, for example, you have some read-write once volumes and you need read write many volumes and you have a Kubernetes cluster and you want to, like, for example, provision a Rook Ceph in there. That's, that's an idea. You can do that if you have to. Um, and there are also some special use case CSI drivers like local path provisioning. Um, I think K3S ships that one, um, just like as a solution to have some sort of storage. Um, and something like the secrets CSI driver which allows you to mount secrets as volumes in your cluster from like a HashiCorp vault or something. You don't have to spill the secrets on a control plane. Um, I did a talk about secrets management last year, so if that stuff interests you, I have a talk on that on YouTube. Um, 
and get, in general, if you want, if you're searching for a CSI driver or if you want to get an overview of what's available, uh, there's this great uh, URL here um, from the Kubernetes CSI um, organization on GitHub, uh, which lists like a lot of them and including features. Speaking of f uh, features, what is CSI? Um, yeah, it's the container storage interface. Its job is to map an existing so storage solution to Kubernetes at, in, that, um, in that role. It handles everything from initial provisioning of the volume, attaching the volume, detaching the volume, res resizing the volume, deleting the volume, cloning the volume, everything. Um, most of the time it's maintained by a storage solution provider. Uh, it's some components of it run as pods in Kubernetes. Uh, those pods are stateless, so you don't really have to worry about them that much. Um, and you either install them via Helm, KLS, Manifest, or it comes with your cluster, so yeah, no modifying node images required. So that's nice. Um, so yeah, how we, did we get here? Like there was a time before um, where all Kubernetes <laughs> sighing in, in the back row again. Um, there was a time where every storage provider in Kubernetes was in tree, which basically meant if you write some, if you had like a storage thingy, a storage solution, let's call them, um, and you want to use them in Kubernetes, you have basically two options. One, get it upstream, or two, if you want to use it, for Kubernetes, which like both options don't sound that fun. One comes with continued maintenance, the other one comes with a six week release window. Um, so there was this thing called flex volumes, which was the first iteration for um, doing out of three storage providers. I have never used them. I'm in the industry for four years, so yeah. Um, then second iteration, CSI was introduced and that became GA. Then the in three storage providers were deprecated, which were like, they had some for I think GCP, AWS and Azure, that those were the, were the big ones. And Short, long story short, yeah, CSI is the only thing today. You don't have to really care about much else. Um, there are also some optional features, which some CSI drivers support, some don't, uh, like volume expansions. Most of them support that, but you might have to flip a switch in the, um, in the storage class. Uh, volume cloning and snapshotting, that exists, but it's not like you can use, you can like, snapshot between storage classes or anything. If you do a snapshot on Azure disk, it stays there. Um, and the third one is raw block devices, which basically allows you to get a PVC without a file system. Um, if you want to like put a Ceph cluster on top of PVC, uh, I have done that, talk to me if you're interested. Um, you need raw block devices and uh, you can get those, but it's option, option features. Some support it, some don't. Okay, uh, really quickly, how does CSI mounting work? Uh, oh fuck, can you read that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it should be okay. Um, so basically, if you schedule a pod which attaches a PVC, um, your kubelet on the node talks to the CSI node drive, uh, driver node pod, which is the thing that's running on every pod via a daemon set, and tells it, yo, there is like a volume over there, please attach it to this node. And that happens, and the mount director is shared with the pod. Oh, I forgot the asterisk there because that's not how it's not simple as that works, but it looks like that, so it's it's okay. Um, and basically that's happened on attached, just like there there's not like magic in there or like some magic cloud shit. No, it's a it's a pod that talks to the API. It might be good. Um, so how do you <laughs> select the right provider? Oh fuck, this is so bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Everybody gangster till the storage cluster stops clustering. Um, if you can avoid it, use the easiest solution possible because you don't want to be the guy that uh, has to like rebuild a storage cluster on the weekend because they decided to like use a storage cluster instead of <laughs> EFS. Um, there are many options, like the list I showed you before, you can read through that. There are some interesting, uh, there are a few interesting projects um, from this, uh, that are CNCF supported. Um, if you need like exotic type can, um, kind of storage. If you're interested, JuiceFS is a very interesting one to look at. Um, again, cloud provider integration, if it's available, use it. Um, also, most sense, so if you happen to have like a data center on-prem, they have CSI plugins. Uh, I know that Pure Storage has one, that NetApp has one. 
And if you really want to host your own cluster, use something well established that is known to work, has like an ecosystem around it, and there are like people that know how that works, and you can actually hire people to maintain that. Like Rooksaf is an example of that. Um, there might be commercial options, but I don't know of them, but I know many people that know how, how Ceph works. So yeah, that's that. Yeah, backups. Uh, quick question, like um, just shout it out. What, what should a backup do? How, what are like some adjectives you would use to describe a backup? Okay, I mean, hot take, but okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's funny because snapshots are not backups. That's not how that works. Um, <laughs> replicas are, by the way, also not backups. If you have RAID, that's, that's not a backup. Um, if you have one backup, you probably can just leave it there and think, okay, yeah, but don't treat it like it's, it's your last hope. Um, if you don't test your backups, they, <laughs> they don't, they, they just don't exist. And this is, this is a permission thing. This I didn't find how how to, how to make the sentence shorter, but I'll explain it later. Um, so basically, if you use some adjectives, they sh they should be immutable. They should be um, tested. You should be replicating them somewhere, and they should not be bound to the infrastructure. So no snapshots, um, <coughs> which basically leaves us with uh, one option: object storage. And we basically just create a bucket, we shove the data there, and um, we have to take care a little bit about permissions. Um, you should like separate <laughs> your backup infrastructure from your regular infrastructure. If it's normal for you to just shove stuff into like a HashiCorp vault or something, um, and then liberally access that through through a CSI driver, uh, through a like secret management solution, yeah, maybe don't do that for the production uh, backups. You should be more restrictive with those. Um, and if you use like S3, there's like this nice feature where you can create keys that can only hide but not delete files. And then you can do a lifecycle rule. So you get basically um, like eventually deleting Im immutable backups, which is really nice in a disaster st scenario. Um, so for like some specific implementations, there's Valero, the classic, like everybody knows that. Um, no one likes it as far as I heard. <laughs> It was originally built to, to back up Kubernetes resources, uh, and then they bolted on the PVC functionality when it became available, because Valero is that old. Um, it's a bit of a pain to integrate it with stuff like databases, <laughs> because you don't want to just like copy the content of a, of a PVC used in a database. You want to dump it or well stream it. We'll talk about that. Um, and the one thing that's interesting that my other solution that I prefer can't do is they can do CSI snapshots, rehydrate those, and dump the content of the snapshot into an object storage. Uh, it operates using a daemon set, so yeah, you have to have some chunky daemon set po uh, pods for Valero running on your cluster. Um, so yeah, you have to calculate with that. Bigger nodes are better in this case. Um, reduces the overhead. And the solution I like to use uh, is Ketchup which is basically a Kubernetes wrapper for, for Rustic, which does backups, and uh, it backs them up into object storage. Um, it has a feature which allows you to, to snapshot databases as part of the backup process. You don't need to have any like Valero CLI stuff running, which and you can set that up pretty easily using normal, like a secret and two resources I'm going to show you soon. Um, it uses jobs for backups, so you have no static overhead during the runtime of, of your applications while not backing up. Um, and yeah, you create like one backup resource per namespace, which, yeah, this is not a backup, this is a schedule, so it runs like regularly. If you have Rustic, this stuff up here should look somewhat familiar because it's how Rustic works. You have some prunes that run um, and handle retention. and you have your credentials down there, and that's everything, and it backs up everything in the cluster. Uh, doesn't matter, read, write ones, read, write many, um, but you can modify that. So if you don't want to back up certain volumes, you can definitely opt out using an annotation. Uh, also, pre-backup pods, uh, you can dump a database. Talk to me later about this, we're running out of time. Uh, <laughs> so what are alternatives to PVCs? Uh, basically, I'm talking about S3 object storage here. Um, if you have some workloads that don't require like partial object updates, um, you should consider using S3 um, because most of the time, 
it's cheaper than object storage per gigabyte, but you pay for downloads most of the time, but not always. And by the way, um, S3 might look expensive, but there are other options. Um, there are other S3 compatible storage providers, and there are also some non S3 compatible object store providers. Um, yeah, Backblaze is an example for an S3 one, or Wasabi, and for the non S3 ones, bunny.net is interesting because they very much advertise themselves not having 100 milliseconds uh, time to first byte latency or so, yeah. Um, and the one thing that's very interesting in like application architecture for S3 is you can create pre-signed URLs, which basically means um, my server has some, has, uh, has a bucket, or like has a back bucket, uh, has some high level, uh, some, sorry, has some high privilege credentials for a S3 bucket and can delegate a single request which can be executed by, for example, a client. Um, and what that allows you to do is you basically make your, your client, uh, your server application only orchestrate how a client interacts with your storage and does it's not in the hot path anymore, which is from a performance perspective, pretty interesting. Um, what looks like something like this, um, your client is, might, if I, you might just be running like some JavaScript in your browser here um, in your, as part of your front end, it requests an upload URL from your backend and then you dump your data directly into, into your bucket. Uh, I mean, this is basically the same thing, I just changed the, um, how, how I, describe the, the arrows, it's the same thing, but for download it also works. And you, what you might also, also be doing is you might just put a CDN between there to get some more performance. Um, also, that works with uh, private content as well. There are definitely CDNs that support authentication. So uh, that's not like for only public stuff. You can use that for private data. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So, databases in cluster. Uh, like, this is a valid question. Why would you do that? Um, I mean, managed databases from like a AWS, Azure, they're fine, they're okay, they're a bit expensive, um, and they integrate a bit shitty with uh, Kubernetes. That's, that's not great. If you want to do like Kubernetes CD for your application delivery, um, that's a bit of an issue if you want to do like on demand test environments. Um, also, I mean, this is not, not a big problem with like asset databases, but if you're using um, NoSQL databases, some vendors do some non-standard stuff there, like DynamoDB um, or Cosmos DB. Those are very heavily inspired by existing open source solutions, but they're not 100% compatible. Um, also, latency might be a thing. If you have like a separate data center with some, some guys running a database cluster, this is mostly an on-premise thing. Um, there might be some latency which will hurt your performance. Also, what also will hurt your performance, but in a different way, is having to communicate with a database team and writing emails to uh, snapshot databases and like restore them. That's not fun. Um, and with Kubernetes, uh, with running a database in Kubernetes, uh, you can probably move around that. Um, so general advice, if you want to try this, please run a database cluster um, and use an operator. Um, use an operator to run it, Helm charts do not count. I know there are Helm charts for MySQL, but they do not work in the way you expect them to because they don't fail over the leader properly. You have to wait until your leader, leader restarts to get like write operations back into your cluster. And uh, that might just take a minute depending on volume attachment time. And if I'm saying a minute, I mean a minute and not 10 seconds. Uh, and during that time, your application will probably not work. Um, and also on the point of like failing over, your application has to either do like client-side um, replication, uh, cl client-side failover handling in your client library, or you have to have to handle it on the application level that your application handles the reconnection event to your database. And as always, monitoring and backups, and the operators all have pretty good monitoring. Uh, just to get through them really quickly, I'm just going to talk about SQL ones, but yeah. Um, if you're using um, SQL databases, use a low latency, fast PVC, so your performance for your database works uh, is, is good. If you have a high latency um, PVC, your database performance will suffer. And also run your database, preferably in the same cluster, um, because then you could, can do like secret sharing. Uh, that might look something like this. Um, my, my writing is a bit 
small well. Um, you basically have the separation on the left side, you have the stuff your users, or in this case developers, uh, interact with. On the right side, you have all the thing that's the problem of the platform people. Um, and as a user, you just create like one DB custom resource. And the, uh, and the operator will generate your credentials, so you don't have to handle those. That's always a good, a good thing. And some services you can interact with and handles in the back end how the database is provisioned using pods and PVCs. Um, and also does failover. Um, some example, oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm really, really short on time now. Okay, Postgres, use po uh, Cloud Native PG, it's great. Zalando, uh, not so much anymore, but. Okay, I mean, yeah, I, the, um, you can use it if you use it for legacy reason, but use CMPG if you have to decide now. Uh, MySQL operator, I worked with it, it's not fun. Uh, it, I'm, I'm not sure so if it's a skill issue or whatever, but I didn't get it to work properly. Um, Vitesse, you can use it. It's not 100% MySQL pod compatible. There are some things that might work, uh, some things that won't. You have to validate your application. Um, and just for funsies, uh, Oracle DB has an operator. I have never seen someone use it, but it exists. If, you, if you're that kind of person and wants to run Oracle DB on, on Kubernetes, it, it is a thing and it's officially supported. It's great. Um, <laughs> and for backups, use val archiving and or regular dumps. All of these operators support those on a like operator level. They do that for you. Uh, now, now I'm come. This is like the the tail end of my talk, where I have some have two things that I have no idea where else to put. Um, yeah, running storage clusters in Kubernetes, you can do that, uh, but you you should do failover on a protocol level. NFS can't do that, so I would not consider Longhorn a good option here. So probably just use Rooksev. Um, it, it's a bit more complicated, but in the end it's worth it not having to worry about, oh, my application just lost all its file handles and can't handle that because that's the same thing as ripping out the disk. Um, and the other thing is latency. Um, if you use network file systems of any kind, doesn't matter if you host them yourself or not, you will introduce some significant latency to, this, to IO. Uh, and even if it's just half a millisecond, um, basically, that basically means you can do 2,000 operations per second. That sounds like much, but if you want to change on like a whole directory structure, that's that's not great. Um, and yeah, high commit and flush latency. You so um, have your application handle that if you're doing like all heavy applications, and if you have to do maintenance, there's stuff like rsync or rclone, especially rclone that really allows you to just crank up the parallel transfers for something like a sync or change on um, will make your life a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, I'll take questions now. Right on time, thank you. Any questions? Well, first, that was super awesome to cover that much in so little time, so congrats. Thank <laughs> um, you so much. I had a, a question on, you said like snapshot bad, and at first I didn't understand, but then you explained, yeah, if it's in the same infrastructure, that's bad. Would you make an exception for stuff like ZFS when you can make a snapshot and then send over that snapshot to something else, or is that still bad for reasons? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can definitely do that. If you can transfer it out of the infrastructure it exists in, it's probably fine. I would just go with the like more standard way of like snapshot to an object storage just for like cost reasons and reliability reasons. And S3 is really easy to provision and you can pretty much be sure that it will exist in like a year's time. Um, and yeah, it, ca it's, it, it just cannot fail in the way a storage cluster you host yourself okay. does. Um, another question, well except if other folks have questions too. <laughs> um, so, I was thinking, do, do you have opinions? For instance, if I'm using, well, let's say I'm doing replicated Postgres of MySQL, uh, I'm in the cloud, and my cloud provider gives me the choice between something like EBS and local NVMe, something like that. And I've been wondering, what would be the scenarios where I would prefer to use the local NVMe because it's kind of faster, but if I lose my instance, it <laughs> blows up, and scenarios where I would prefer, well, I'm going to use EBS because if the instance blows up, I'm safe, but at the same time, the latency is going to cap my 
IOPS, and if I have replication, losing the instance shouldn't be a big deal. Like um, that's a very good question. Um, basically, one thing you haven't considered is EBS have an annualized failure rate. Right. E EBS can fail. That's not like magic. It hasn't yeah. like some some guarantee that it won't fail. It can also fail. And I mean, the difference between my EBS volume is failing and my NVMe drive is failing, you're going to have to reschedule anyway. So um, probably really doesn't matter. Also, if your cloud provider has like that option, they will explain it to you. So mostly it's a performance thing. If you do proper backups and if the cloud provider did their homework, which they probably did, um, you were probably fine either way. And yeah, it comes down to cost and performance. And you personally, like, do you see one of them more or would personally go with one of them more? Uh, Completely depends on the okay. workload. Yeah. Intuitively, I would yeah. just go with EBS until it doesn't work anymore. Okay. <laughs> if you look up the first page of CNPG, they, s they, say they state that they came to this project because you have local uh, disks, lo local NVMe drives, you can get really high IOPS. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can add something to that. What's your experience? I honestly just have one experience, which is um, on Hetzner Cloud, I tried uh, like a performance thing there. Uh, on Hetzner Cloud, I tried to use Postgres using their um, block storage, but that just didn't meet our performance criteria and then we use their local disk. So yeah, they, they have a point there and that's basically the same point uh, the, um, the man in the front in the back ma made. You, it's, it's a performance thing. The local disk will always be faster if you basically have to commit every transaction to disk before it uh, returns. And um, there's no way around it. You have to probably use local disks. Um, but for most things, you should be okay otherwise. Anyone else? Uh, side note, I'm the Valero community manager and you seemed a <laughs> very nice person in the beginning, not anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm so you. sorry. <laughs> thank you very much it's once again. It's hard to use. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I'm remark, sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. <laughs> uh, our sessions continue downstairs on the, the main area where Anis is going to do the next one, right? Yeah? Oh yeah, okay, so you can rest. <laughs> right.